the podcast is a unique way to meet somebody and get introduced to someone who's really busy and doesn't and hears from a lot of different people and you just need to stand out in a podcast is kind of a unique way to do that that um, in a weird way builds credibility within um, in a different way that folks aren't as used to and so it makes you stand out and so a lot of the time like just getting just standing out and getting someone's attention is is a lot of the battle Alex, welcome to the show. I'm excited today. Thanks for having me, Chris. Really excited to be here. Um, it's been a real joy getting to know you over the last couple of years. Um, you're unbelievably talented, and I look forward to unpacking some of that today. I think a fun place to start would be a tweet that was, I think, your second best of all time. Uh, but it's something that we've talked about and something that we have in common. And it was basically like this. If you're looking to buy a business, don't start a search fund, start a podcast. What? Let's unpack that. Yeah, so that was a, um, it's this ongoing idea or thesis that I want someone to do, which is use content as a way to gain credibility in an industry and acquire a business in that industry. So um, the the podcast for me has been helpful to meet business owners, but think like an owner isn't industry specific. I'm not just talking to software or data or whoever. It's a wider range. However, if you were someone who wanted to go buy a company and you knew kind of the rough target industry or maybe region, then you can create content for that region, build credibility of that industry, start interviewing some of the experts there, get some CEOs on. And over time, if your show is big enough or influential enough in that industry, you might be able to get sponsors from that industry who want to reach those people who you're interviewing and who are listening. And then if that works, then you might be able to get potentially just a couple thousand bucks to at least pay for the podcast or help subsidize your search and living expenses while you go look for a business. And um, I think the core idea is just that the podcast is a unique way to meet somebody and get introduced to someone who's really busy and doesn't and hears from a lot of different people and you just need to stand out in a podcast is kind of a unique way to do that that um in a weird way builds credibility within um in a different way that folks aren't as used to and so it makes you stand out and so a lot of the time like just getting just standing out and getting someone's attention is is a lot of the battle that makes a lot of sense um this is an entrepreneurship podcast, but a lot of people think of it as a real estate podcast. And I can say for certain, um, having this podcast has helped our real estate efforts, whether it's deal flow, meeting people in the industry, getting, uh, raising money, hiring people. Uh, it's been huge. Are there any other examples that you've come across of folks that have used content, whether it be podcast or something similar, uh, kind of to do this? I think of like Brent B. Shore. He's, maybe one of the godfathers of using content as a way to buy businesses, but anybody else you, comes to mind? Yeah, I mean, Brent Bishore is probably the best example. First off, because he believes in it so strongly, like his market, his his background is marketing, so he knows content really well. Um, and he's put on a really good conference for a while. But he's also just been doing it for a long time. So we can see down the road, okay, Brent's doing this for what, seven, eight, nine years to this point. So, and he's been doing content the whole time. So we can see what does this look like if I just keep doing it and it keep it continues to compound? What does that eventually turn into? Brent is the best case study for that. Um, there are smaller examples. Chenmark has a weekly newsletter that they put out that's pretty popular. Um, they also go on a, lo- a lot of other podcasts, including my own, and talk about Chenmark and the businesses that they run and the GVP like, CEO program that they run. Um, so. There's examples like that, but I, I, there's not a ton of examples I can think of about on folks who are using content to acquire companies. Some folks will use, you know, larger Twitter accounts. Alex from Ozzy, I can think of as someone like that. Um, so I think just the lack of plentiful examples is why I think the opportunity exists and is so interesting. And it's kind of that that next layer of podcasting. So we today a lot of podcasts monetize through advertising, but 
what's more valuable, the, the couple thousand bucks you get through advertising or perhaps more if you're a larger show or buying a you know multi-million dollar business that grows and then helps you, the podcast helps you recruit into that business or find other companies. Um, it, it just seems like the obvious monetization down the line. And I just don't see as many people doing that. And I want someone to go out and do it. And so I'm just thinking, oh, maybe I should just do it myself here. I love it. Well, maybe we can unpack that. On that notion of content, uh, uh, a, a little bit of angle to this. Last week, I was asked to um, basically ho- moderate a fireside chat for the founders of Hotels.com, which for anybody listening was maybe the most successful tech IPO of all time. Um, and one of the things I asked him was around just kind of how they grew the business. And like, uh, without like, without question, he said, um, it was all PR. Like back then in the early 2000s, he would get on this weekly, I guess it was a podcast then, and he would talk about the business. And as soon as he started taking the PR angle rather than the advertising angle, he's like, we could not, the phones were ringing nonstop. And so his whole message in that little segment of the conversation was, if you really want to attract loyal followers and customers, do more great PR, not great advertising. He just thought it was infinitely better. And the podcast, I'm sure you know this, has proven true, whether it be guests that have been on here that have had remarkable stories from people that they've met from being on here or vice versa for me, like the the doors that continue to open because one, podcasts are authentic. Two, you're not really selling. You're just having a conversation and then people are listening in and um, it just creates a lot of warm introductions uh, that nobody feels kind of threatened by. So it's been a, a really cool experience and I totally agree with your thesis on that. It's very conversational and it doesn't, you're right, there's no clear and obvious sales angle. And to your point around or the story around the hotels.com and, and PR, um, makes me think that content is more about letting folks know what you're doing and just marketing your mission. And the more people that know about what you want, what you're seeking and what you care about, the more folks can help you in various ways that you can't really predict. I think the like, podcasting and content and putting yourself out there, putting your your mission out there and sharing it, it just gives you this kind of call option on serendipitous opportunities that can happen to you. And um, folks that you'll come you know, cross paths with you or hear about your show in some various way or is forwarded from a friend. And so you now get to talk to this person that otherwise you never really would have been able to talk with. Yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. It's awesome. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit more about uh, just how the podcast has impacted you. So you've had yours now for what, four years or three years? We're almost at five years at the start of December. So December 1st, 2018 was my first podcast with uh, Trish Higgins. And so what comes to mind, um, we can talk about your chief of staff role, or if you want to dabble in some other things of like, what are some highlights that have come from you running this podcast that maybe you expected or didn't expect? I think that it's probably helpful to start out with the the mission of the podcast. So at the back in 2018, I was in college. So that was my the fall of my senior year. And at that point, I didn't really have a clear sense for what a job if I was going to get a job in search or small business acquisition or just small business generally, I didn't really know what that would be. So I thought, okay, this podcast will help me meet interesting people. And this will be just if I just keep doing that, if I, you know, so far, if I've met interesting people, good things happen. If I just create this podcast, I presume that that will continue to happen and good things will come of it. So the idea was, I just want to meet folks who are doing this. And I just continue doing it through college. Um, it was my episodes were monthly and um, I was doing the editing myself. There's no sponsors. Um, so it was very, very low budget. But um, eventually around August, 2020, um, I was going to get married and the podcast had grown enough. And that my folks that I knew, I, the number of people I knew in the space was growing enough that I felt like, okay, I could probably do a weekly show. And I wanted to do weekly because monthly is brutal. It's hard to have a, have a consistent listener base with a monthly show because nobody really knows when your episodes come out. Like you can say, 
episodes are out the first of every month, but the first of every month, it could be a Monday this month, or it could be a Wednesday next month, and it's just not very predictable. Um, and so it's better to have weekly. It's, I think that's the right cadence, at least for me. Um, and so I wanted to, to go do that. But um, in order to go weekly, I knew that I needed to probably not do the audio editing anymore because it took me five to six hours per episode to do all the editing and production. And that was while working a full-time job. And so um, I don't recommend that if you're able to avoid it. So um, having someone like Johnny, who Johnny joined Think Like an Owner down the road. Um, but to the, uh, like for the first thing I did was found um, a couple of sponsors uh, in August, 2020, who were supportive of the mission for the show. And I think part of it was I wanted something like invest like the best for small companies and CEOs of small companies. I just didn't find anything out there. And so I thought I'll create it myself. And so the pitch in August, 2020 of sponsors was this, there's nothing else like this. There isn't another podcast that has this audience that you, that is primarily your customer base. So you should sponsor this show, help me get to weekly. And it was kind of almost a venture investment for them. Like to help me turn this monthly show into a weekly show and your investment while above market today will match market down the road as the show grows and leads come your way and whatnot. And so Thursday before my Saturday wedding, I left my full-time job <laughs> and went into marriage unemployed. Um, her parents were very supportive. Um, her her dad's an entrepreneur, so he he got it. Um, but that was both a fun and scary time. I would not do that again today, but I'm glad that I at least did it once um, and realized, I think, after the wedding, like the week after the wedding, I was like, oh, this is just, this is what I do now. I'm, uh, there's, it's all on me to make this work. And that was both scary, but exhilarating to realize that you're now more in control of what you do and work on and doing something super fun and engaging and meeting interesting people along the way. And so one of the things that happened was, um, about a year and a half later in March, 2022, I got to know Clayton Collins, who's the CEO of HW media. He, so HW media is a housing media business for mortgage, real estate title, everything down the line. And it's a media business with housing wire, real trends, and then a couple other, um, brands at this point. Um, but what he was looking to do was take this media business and add data to it. And so create a, a Bloomberg of sorts for housing where you have the, the Bloomberg media business and the Bloomberg terminal, and they work together and have flywheels between the two where think of like a Bloomberg article that references the Bloomberg terminal. Now you as the reader are aware of the Bloomberg terminal. Maybe you go reach out and have a conversation and that that lead for the Bloomberg terminal was actually had negative customer acquisition costs because the media business made money giving you that article. And so you have this negative customer acquisition cost vehicle to get uh, customers into your data business. And so we thought, okay, we have this media business. Why don't we do the same thing? Find a data company that we can plug uh, negative customer acquisition cost into and accelerate the growth of that data company and be a true value add, uh, you know, acquirer for that business. And so hearing all of this, I was like, oh, this is super exciting. And my goal is to go run a business one day. And we structured the chief of staff role as a MBA in operations. I don't have an MBA. Um, and so I wanted to have that experience with any small company on how they, how they grow. What does a growing one look like? How does a how does a CEO run a management team and learn all about you know corporate development and deal processes and what have you? And so joined in March 22 because of the podcast. That opportunity ha only happened because Clayton saw that I was just as passionate about about media and data as he is, and we connected on that. And he brought me on as chief of staff. And so last year we could talk about the chief of staff role itself and kind of why it's becoming more popular. Um, or seemingly more popular. Um, perhaps I'm just in a search bubble and um, chief of staffs are popular here, but no, nowhere else. But um, the I remember thinking about the chief of staff role for the first time. And you think of chief of staff as something in government, like they're, they're going to the White House and having meetings with the president and senators and what have you. And um, that certainly exists, but there's a kind of growing chief of staff role amongst um, startups who are actually doing it a lot too in, in Silicon Valley. But 
um, more and more you're seeing it in the in these small growing companies where the CEO has a lot of projects that they care about, but doesn't necessarily have all of the time and space in their schedule to do every single thing, or they have something that they're really focusing hard on, but could use some extra support in, and they want a a peer type hire who can come in and think similarly to a CEO and take on projects from the perspective of the CEO versus as a executive assistant or as a a team or department head. Um, The other advantage to a chief of staff or other design of the role is um, any, any different department or individual contributor has a really strong perspective on what they do, but it's often, they're often not sure exactly what's happening across the company and other teams. And so if you're the CEO trying to get a sense for what's happening, you're going to get all these different perspectives, all of which are, are true in some ways, but maybe have missing facts that don't overlap. And so a chief of staff can come in and give you ideally a comprehensive look and view and understanding of what's happening in a company and, um, and just be a sounding board for ideas and things that you can work on next with them. What's your process for being in the know so that you can give that comprehensive look? Like how, how do you, how do you go about your days, weeks, months to make sure that, that you can fill that gap? So last year, that was a closer description of my role. Um, last December, we bought a housing market data business, and I stepped into that business and took over um, the sales function for the licensing business there. So my role has become much closer to an individual contributor versus a chief of staff. However, last year during that time where it was much more of a traditional chief of staff role, um, I think the key part was having one-on-ones with uh, department or team leaders across the company, but also finding ways and excuses to work together on something and hear how they think through problems or what challenges they're facing and how I can be helpful there. And I think coming from the perspective of let me help you with things because I have this ability to jump around and be a, um, a free agent of sorts within the company. Um, it gives people permission to let you help them with certain projects and that helps you understand how different teams work, what they're working on, what they're focusing on. Um, and I think that gives you a, a wider perspective within the company. Um, and is it's meant to be additive to the CEO. So the CEO will have their own means of communication and understanding of how the company works. You're meant to add an additional perspective. You're not meant to replace the CEO's communication, of course. Were you the first chief of staff that, that they had ever hired or were you? Okay. So uh, maybe question was, um, how was it received amongst the team given that you were the first and like, was everybody all these one-on-ones that you started sitting in on? Like, maybe you could give a little color of like, what did those first few meetings look like? Were people expecting them? Were they a little caught off guard? Um, Cause I think where I'm getting at is I think this chief of staff role is becoming more popular. I think a lot of folks you'll see over the next decade uh, will continue to add this role into their company. And so maybe we could just use this as like some lessons learned, but for somebody that's going to hire one right out the gate, like how is it integrating with the team? Like right out the gate? I think most folks weren't expecting me because there wasn't a, there wasn't a formal process for, there wasn't a long recruiting process to whittle down the candidates for chief of staff and then pick one. Um, It was more serendipitous that Clayton and I connected and decided this would be a good fit for the role. So um, with the normal hiring process, a lot of folks are kind of aware that you're looking for this role, you're going to fill it, here's a couple of candidates, lots of folks get to talk with them, and then there's a hire. And so there's lots of time for everyone to prepare for that new role coming in. That wasn't necessarily the case with, uh, with my hire at HW Media. And so I joined a management team, introduced myself, and then started having one-on-ones with folks and just sharing kind of what, I, you know, the best that I could un- articulate at the time, you know, what is my goal here? What am I, where can I be helpful? And what is my, um, like, how do I add value to this, this team? Um, and I think it's just a, it's kind of a nebulous role. There's not a clear job description or set of day-to-day duties. Um, I didn't have any direct reports. And that's intentional because they the idea of being a the one thing you want to do as chief of staff is have time in your schedule so that you can take on projects really quickly. So if something happens, you have this space that 
isn't currently filled with any operational day-to-day things you're working on and you can take on projects faster. Um, and so I didn't have a clear even set of tasks to share with folks at that point because it was so early on. And so it took probably a month or so for folks to understand uh, what I was there for and that um, I wasn't a, I was there to help and add value and not um, you know, threaten any existing project or what have you. Um, I wasn't coming in because someone else wasn't doing a good job. I was there to just help and move things forward and not take projects from others or anything like that. So that took a little bit of time. Can you give an example of maybe a project that you expected to have and then maybe a project that you didn't expect would land on your plate? Well, a project I was really excited about out of the gate was creating a, a mobile app for Housing Wire. So a lot of media businesses, New York Times, Bloomberg, they'll have mobile apps for iPhone and Android for you to flip through their news articles. And there's a couple companies that create those really well and will te- effectively take a, a skin of your website and mobilize it into this app. Um, and I thought, okay, this would be a good project. This seems fairly straightforward. Let me start going doing in the, doing this. And um, of course, I'm not bringing any new ideas to anyone here. Like every every idea I have has been thought about before, and yeah. so I think that's the thing <laughs> that I I didn't really fully I didn't fully understand that at the time. And so I went to our our VP of product and said, Hey, can I help you build an iPhone app or put one together? And you know, here's a list of contractors or you know developers that do it really well. And here's some examples of what we could do. And he, he said, oh, we have actually done this. We've thought through this before. Um, it doesn't work for these reasons. These other projects are more important. And I was like, oh, okay, this makes sense. But um, the, I think the core lesson there was every idea has been thought about before. There's nothing, I, there's really nothing new that I'm thinking of necessarily. Maybe around the edges or connecting certain dots together, but not in a like, hey, we should create a mobile app or we should do this new conference. Those things are, are less um, novel to folks. And so they have generally been thought through before and placed in a certain priority. And it's probably better for me to ask, has this been thought about before and where in the priority list does it fall? And that determines whether I help them with that project or not versus coming in and yeah. So they said, we're going to do a, an app. Um, obviously there was a team that was going to work on what was your role in that? Just communicating to Clayton, what was like what was going on and where the progress was and how it was going? Or were you actually like, contri- were they asking you to do things to help push that project forward? Uh, communication, certainly. Um, but leading discussions with that developer was going to be a part of it. But again, this is a project we didn't do. So we okay, like, got this it. got shut down very quickly. Um, as an example of a project where I thought it would be, you know, I thought the it would follow here in the priority list and it actually fell here. It was not a not something we pursued. Um, But there are other projects like we wanted to understand who the different data companies out there were and which ones fit best. And I knew that that would be a big part of my role because that's what I was really excited about. Um, I didn't fully grasp that we were doing all these market maps and other things. So that was a project that we took on. And actually another project we took on was we wrote a a white paper about 30 pages of research on how media and data companies combine really effectively. So we took case studies from uh, Bloomberg, from Freight Waves. I know you've had Craig Fuller on the podcast before. Um, He's probably the best modern example of a really effective media and data strategy combining together. Um, And so we've taken a lot of lessons from Freight Waves and just have just asked a bunch of questions over the last two years to that business and learned a ton. Um, but I'd say that was a, a core example for that project. But project was just a matter of, okay, these 30 pages, we're going to talk about how do media data businesses combine? Why are they effective? Why do they help each other? What's the flywheel between the two businesses? How do you take a media audience and introduce them to your paid product at the bottom of the funnel? Um, how do you, what kind of data products work really well? What industries do you focus on? So if you're going to do this from scratch, if you're going to go out and search, should you, should you go buy the media business first? Should you go buy the data business first? How do you complement the two together? Um, that was a big project that um, I had a lot of fun with, but didn't really see coming, but quickly became a good 
um, you know, project written asset for us to use while thinking through our own strategy and then through um, the acquisition of Altos Research. You said you love data companies. You kind of started hitting on why. Let's kind of expand uh, here. And so I'm going to re retell you what I think I heard, which was these nice flywheels are you have people consuming your media. They already like you and trust you. And uh, through that, you're able to weave in your uh, data products that are for sale. And so people are reading media. They love it. They like it. Oh, I see this data product that this company that's showing me media owns as well. Maybe I should jump over and start using that too. And the data company didn't really have to pay for that customer. In fact, they made money while acquiring that customer. Is that fair? Yeah. And in this concept of content used to market a, a paid product, it certainly isn't novel or isn't just in media and data. I mean, you see it on an individual level. Um, we both had Nick Huber on our podcast recently. He's sent a lot of people to support Shepard. Like that's an example of taking a, a content funnel and audience and introducing them to a paid product they would very likely be interested in using and increasing the value of that paid product in that business through your content. Um, same thing for, you know, a really common one with health podcasts is you have are a health podcaster and you own a supplement business or, you know, workout business of some kind or protein powder business, whatever. And so the two feed off each other. And th the same thing happens with media companies and data uh, with Freight Waves and Bloomberg being the probably the cornerstone examples that I can think of. Um, but just broadly, I think data companies are the greatest companies we've ever made if they're a proprietary data set. Um, a phenomenal example is a company called Smith Travel Research. Have you heard of this company? So they were acquired by CoStar um, a handful of years ago. Uh, but the the data they gathered, so it started out as a consortium of hotels all contributing data on occupancy, room rates, and so they could have their own competitive intelligence for how, how to price their rooms or how they were performing relative to their peer set, whether that peer set was in their, um, in their same city or in comparably sized cities. And Smith Travel Research, STR, would give you a score. And that score in this data became so ingrained in the industry that that STR score became a part of hotel managers' performance compensation. And so part of your performance review as a hotel manager was what was your STR score and did it improve, did it change? And it became so embedded that you, you cannot operate a hotel without STR data. And it's just a, a phenomenal example of one, a data set that is proprietary. STR has access to that data. It's not public. It's not being taken off the web like stock market data and organized in a clean way like SEC filings. Um, it's proprietary, has a clear use case and value set. It ties to revenue for those hotels. Like Hotels use STR to optimize their revenue and make money, which is a pretty amazing use case for data. And so Companies like that are just amazing and so hard to replace and so hard to compete against. Um, the challenge is with data companies is there's not that many of them. So if another company wanted to create a competitor to STR and have all of this data on occupancy, pricing, what have you for all these hotels, there's not really a reason a hotel would choose the new competitor versus STR because STR has so much more data and it's probably going to have a lot of the same data as the small competitor. And so with any of these, with any of these industries, you're probably only going to have one to two main data players in that space. And this can be really hard for anyone else to compete. Think about credit card data being sold to hedge funds. There's probably only a handful of people who need to be selling credit card data because ultimately you're just selling facts. You're selling the same facts as the person next door. We don't need a ton of, you know, as opposed to software where you can have hundreds of different ERP software businesses, um, but data only has generally only a couple in each given space. And so it makes them harder to find and harder to start, but when they have a competitive advantage, it's an amazing business. How are these businesses usually set up and structured? Um, 
And do they do they have licenses with certain folks to get that proprietary data that they need kind of regularly? Like what are how does what makes up a data company? What are the different functions and how are they usually set up? So in in gathering the data, there's a a handful of ways. And the, the paper I reference most is this paper that Abraham Thomas wrote. He's the founder of Quandle. He wrote a paper called The Economics of Data Businesses, which is the best explanation for how a data company works, why it creates value. Um, and there's a bunch of reasons like you mentioned, not you mentioned a couple for how, um, how these companies gather data, they can license it from others. So certain data vendors have data sets, they'll license that from those folks, you don't own and control the data, but you can get access to the data. Um, there's public records data, think property level data, um, or public filings, like financial filings, SEC filings. Um, so you can gather it publicly. Um, there's proprietary. So you have access to a, a bunch of different proprietary data sets, either from you know this group of customers, perhaps. So one example is um, FreightWaves gathers data on from software platforms that trucking companies use to price their loads. And so they can get this pricing data directly from the software business and they can anonymize it and clean it up a little bit. Um, but that's an example of something that's a little bit more proprietary and less public. It's not public out there um, that you could go grab it. Um, there's pay to play. So you could just pay um, for data, pay to complete surveys, um, for example, or pay to pull in certain data from companies. You'd have to go individually one by one. So it would take some time. Um, but there's lots of ways. There's there's a whole bunch of others too. But um, at its core, a data company creates value when it has a data set that generally helps make a company more money or save on costs and has some proprietary edge that will keep that data company around and valuable for a long period of time. Um, it's harder to create a lasting data company just relying on public data unless you're taking some unique angle or mixing that public data with some other proprietary data set and the two together become more valuable. Um, one example of this is a company called uh, SafeGraph. Um, one thing that they do, this is uh, Oren Hoffman's company. He has a podcast called um, The World of DAS that is a really amazing data podcast. Um, also talks about the business of data, which is why I think it's so interesting. Um, but what they do is they tell you it's point of interest data. So if you are a retail location at a shopping mall, you can buy data from SafeGraph that will tell you how many people walked by your store, how many people went into your store, and then how many of those people purchased from you. So they are taking a couple different data sets. So they take credit card data, which has been around for a really long time and isn't that novel. Hedge funds have been using it for decades to estimate things, but um, they took the credit card data and they added data from cell phones and cell phone location. So the two combined created this whole new business use case for traffic and then conversion rate within a store. And so as an example of something that's not proprietary, like this credit card data isn't necessarily proprietary and cell phone data probably isn't either, even though it's relative, it's newer than credit card data, but the two combined created something really interesting that is helpful and valuable. And they now have um, this huge data team that's become really good at analyzing it and creating value from it. So um, you'll generally have a team that helps ingest the data. And oftentimes this data isn't clean. It needs to be uh, organized and there's duplicates or there's messy data. And so um, you might have you know potentially dozens of people whose whole job is just to clean the data as it comes in. Um, I know FreightWaves has a couple dozen people and um, Altus Research has about half a dozen folks who focus on the data and making it clean and organized. Um, and so that's a, that's a huge piece. And then of course you have sales teams and marketing teams and all the typical functions you'll see in a business, but um, the data side is, is really fascinating to me. You're getting me fascinated in it. I'm going to go run through a wall and buy a data company. <laughs> uh, so I got a few questions. Um, are we basically everything we do now in society, like we are creating data for others, almost every movement we make? I mean, I, I, I know my iPhone right here is giving data by the day. Somebody asked me the other day, like, do you like privacy? And I was like, of course I do. And they're like, no, you hate it. 
And I was like, no, I don't. I love it. They're like, why do you carry an iPhone with you everywhere you go? And then they, I can't remember the number, but they were like, there are like a thousand points of data being tracked on you almost at every point in time. Um, so like you said that, uh, I guess it was whatever safety page or or what'd you call it? Um, safe graph, safe graph. But is it, is it fair to say we're like moving into a world where just about every single thing we're doing is creating data for somebody to do something with? I think so. I, I, and I, that doesn't mean that every data point has value. Um, it just means that there's more to measure. There's more that could be measured. And it's up to us to decide which data sets combined have value. Um, one that um, I had, uh, Brian Yormack, who's a venture capitalist who invests in data companies. And there's a business that he's invested in that help, it's an API between cars with GPS trackers and the manufacturers or the rental car owners or whoever. And they can track the location and mileage of their cars and see, um, are they are they driving well? Is there maintenance going to be required here pretty soon? What's happening with the, bit, with the vehicle? And so that's an example of you know, tracking data being used and now coming online and being available. Um, but I think one of the uh, things that's exciting about this time is that, more, as you said, more and more things are being tracked and it's giving us data sets that we just didn't have before uh, that weren't available, even if you wanted them. So satellite imagery that's daily is its own whole use case of data that's now coming online that we didn't have before. So you can look at all the fields in Nebraska, my wife and I, we just moved from Omaha, Nebraska to Boise. But if you wanted to estimate corn crop yields, you could use satellite data to help you estimate how crop yields are going to be in Nebraska this year. And that's data that is coming online really for the first time in the last decade or so. Um, Brian Yormack, even he also invested in this company that creates uh, these like onesies for babies. And it has a, a health monitor. So your baby can be sleeping at night. And it also has a, a camera if you want that can sense movement. And if it's if your baby is turning over or if they're sleeping or if they're awake, and it gives you kind of this whoop, you know, sleep data, but for your your baby now. And so you can have all of this information on how's your baby sleeping? Is he, is he sleeping through the night? Is he doing well or is she doing well? Um, and so that's a data set that you just didn't have before that didn't exist. Um, same with whoop, like that's data that we didn't have before, but now a lot more folks have sleep trackers. And so whoop as a company has, d- has sleep data on, I don't know how many customers they have, but thousands or maybe millions one day of number of customers who have these whoop trackers and are tracking their sleep. And so we'll know what's, you know, you know, you as a, you know, 30 year old, 40 year old, 50 year old, like how, what, what is your sleep benchmark against your peer set? Like, how do you rank amongst 40 year olds for, for sleep? Are you in the top 1%? What can you adjust? What have other folks noticed that helps their sleep, you know, alcohol or exercise, whatever. Um, so stuff like that is going to be really exciting, but a lot of that's happening because there's data sets that are, that are coming online for the first time that we just didn't have before that didn't exist. And that's exciting. Um, do it, from your view, it does AI, uh, impact the data world? And if so, in what ways? I think at the very least AI is helping to clean up data and can be, can be real helpful in some of the, there's a huge workload once you have data in cleaning it up and making sure it's not messy or disorganized, formatted properly. And I think a lot of AI tools could be helpful in that process because that's typically a very tedious and menial process um, that could that has a lot of parts that could be automated or at least have a AI tool come in and help you do things faster. So looking to check to make sure that these you know certain properties have the right address or the bed bath you know makes sense you know it doesn't make sense that there'd be a four bedroom house with only a half bath like that seems like uh, an error of some kind ai might be able to help you find that error faster so that you don't have to spend all your time scrolling through or looking around and doing all these different um you know v lookups and whatever you could have an ai function help you identify those faster and you could go and start solving them faster so i think there's ways there's things like that that could be helpful um 
I've not studied AI in data beyond that, though. There's probably ways that AI could be helpful in gathering data. Um, I haven't seen any examples quite yet, though. Okay. Um, you've said you want to buy a business and run a business, and you've always said that that data is what fascinates you. So maybe let's just like talk about what it might look like to buy a data business, what you're looking for. So what would be the criteria if you saw it come through that you would say, boom, that's a data business I want to buy? I think it has to be a certain size. Uh, data companies that are too small, uh, companies that are small often stay small or are small for a reason. Um, but there's uh, if you can find a data business that has reached a certain amount of scale, it could indicate that you're finding a larger product market fit. Um, but can I think you, real quick, I don't mean to interrupt. Can you describe what scale might look like in data? Scale, but I'm thinking more of a revenue standpoint, something like 5 million in ARR or above or 10 million in ARR and above. Um, if you're too small, it means you usually haven't established that competitive edge. And if you're larger, there's a stronger indication that you have a competitive edge at some point. Talked about how in any given space, there's only one or two data companies that make up most of the market share. That's definitely true if you're looking at a data company to acquire, certainly. Um, but I think the other part, the, maybe the more important part is just that it's a proprietary data set. It's not organizing public data or something that's easily scraped or pulled from various sources that another competitor could replicate for cheaper. Ideally, you're looking at a data business that has access to a, a database that is that they own or own access to, and because that's going to be your competitive edge over time. Otherwise, you're you're going to be fighting uphill versus com versus competitors who are able to do it cheaper, faster, what have you. Um, that's going to be uh, a hard uphill battle, and it's much easier to build a business around a data set you own and operate. How do you value them? They're valued similar to SaaS companies. They have a lot of similar characteristics as SaaS. Uh, there's recurring revenue. They're often uh, subscription-based. A lot of them have multi-year contracts. Um, you're giving an ongoing data set. So there's a product that is ongoing, similar to SaaS. Um, and you're always making improvements. So um, most of the time, they are a subscription business. And so they're going to be valued like SaaS businesses. And that's going to be a factor of how large they are, how fast they're growing, whether it's a, uh, most of the time it'll be some ARR multiple of some kind, um, potentially EBITDA if it's cash flowing or what have you. But um, most of the time we've seen them be ARR based similar to SaaS companies. So um, a lot of the research around SaaS is, is pretty applicable to data companies. And I'm assuming they're just really sticky because once a company like a customer starts building their business using the data coming from this data company, and you said there's usually one to two players, it's pretty sticky. If if the business keeps getting built around that data that they're buying from, call it your company or whatever company, it's it gets stickier and stickier with time. Yeah. I mean, take Altus Research, for example, their housing market data is the most comprehensive on the market. It's not affiliated with any MLS. Um, MLS has most of the um, housing data because that's just where realtors will post or list homes for sale. Um, but there's, of course, other places that folks will list homes. If, you're you're, if it's for sale by owner, you might not list on the MLS, but you'll still have a house for sale. And so Altos has a much more comprehensive data set, and that allows you to have this competitive edge where you are the only vendor who has that kind of comprehensive look. And once a company has taken your data and has integrated it into a product, whether it's an AVM, uh, automated valuation model, or rental valuation model, um, it's not something you can take out. It's become an ingredient in that product. Um, you still have to, of course, find the right customers who are able to use that data effectively. But once it's in that uh, in that product or in that company, it is it is really hard and really sticky to take out. Um, Orrin Hoffman has this awesome phrase that I love. He says, as a data company, you're selling butter to pastry chefs. And you can talk about how high quality our butter is and how amazing it is, organic, uh, you know, graze, you know, the, 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 the cows you know, roamed free over this hillside <laughs> their whole lives. We gave them delicious grass and whatever. But And so the butter is amazing. But unless the chef knows how to work with high quality butter, and if 
it's not going to be very valuable. If the chef is not very good, your butter is going to go into this kind of mediocre croissant or something. So you have to match the high quality butter with a chef who understands how to use it and has the skills to use that butter effectively in the end product that they sell. I love it. Um, would you, if you bought one, would your goal be to create that flywheel where you have a content business alongside of it? Or would you, would you mind just owning a data company just as a data company? I think to go with the, the flywheel approach with having a media and data company, I think it's most important to buy the media business first. I think the buying the media business first means you are getting the audience and you can work with that audience and understand what they eventually want. Otherwise, you're buying a data business and you don't have a clear direction on which audience is going to fit well with them. Whereas with once you buy the media business first, and ideally you're buying a top you know, one to three media brand within a given space, um, it's hard to take, it's hard to go buy the number five media player in a space and have a sustainable business. Because when the tide washes out in the next economic cycle, all of the advertisers are going to cut budgets wherever they can, but they might hold on to their budgets at the top player because they know that that's going to be where all their their return and spend is going to be primarily coming from. And so if you can buy that top one or two media brand in a space, then you understand you have a, a wide audience that you can work with to understand what products they would be most interested in using, whether that's a data product or something else. And then from there, you go either buy or build a data company out of that audience or from that audience. So is that the route you would prefer to go or do you would you just buy a data business and just own a data business? Uh, to this point, I think I would buy a data business and run a data business, but um, I'm very open to, to the other way and going the media and data route too. There's value in both. So if you did that though, just bought a data business to own a data business, what are the... I'm probably asking dumb questions, but I think they're they're valid to some degree. Is like, are you buying that and then you're just trying to find more customers? Like that's the way that you grow it, or are you buying it and trying to create new sets of data and sell into the existing customers, or is it both? I think there's probably a, a whole bunch of ways, but um, you can, of course, grow your existing customer base for the existing product that you sell. Um, but you may also discover verticals around the edges that use your data in some way and you can build a product for them out of the core data set you already have um, so if you had a you know that hotel business uh, data that data is probably also valuable to hedge funds so there's probably a version of the data that you could sell to a hedge fund um, so there's I think any data set where there's value for one party there's probably value in another party but perhaps in a different way and so I think there is expansion beyond your existing kind of ideal customer profile. Um, like the, the exercise we're going through with Altos is what is our ideal customer look like for this data business? Focus on that, learn how they buy, learn why they buy, what data they care about, get really good at that ideal customer, and then only then expand to others and see who along the edges is interesting and could work with with this data and then expand from there. So um, there's a whole bunch of, I, I'm fascinated by how data sales teams and SaaS sales teams work. And so that kind of slow expansion over time into other verticals um, is I think really interesting, but um, I think that's what you'd end up doing. Let's bring it home on that note because that's a note that we have. So you you're fascinated by how these sales teams work, why? I I thought I, I didn't think sales would be very interesting, uh, but I've been proven very wrong. Um, so what did bought, you what did you think it was, and how have you been proven wrong? I thought it would be monotonous, not very interesting, boring, kind of grindy, and uh, without much payoff, and um, not sleazy, but just not a very comfortable thing to be doing. And when we bought Altos, we saw that this licensing business selling the raw data was a um, was a pretty new business and didn't have a lot of structure and certainly didn't have many many dedicated dedicated sales resources. And so we quickly saw that this was an opportunity for me to come in and help uh, lead a lot of those sales efforts. 
Um, and so coming in, I realized, oh, wow, actually sales is super interesting because it activates every part of your brain. It's the creative, how do I reach this person? Who's the right person to talk to at this company? It's the like um, the conversational piece, like podcasting, the interviewing and talking to someone new. How do I how do I learn about this person who I'm this prospect? How do I learn what they care about, what problem they're trying to solve? And how do I like in the back of my head try to match them with a product that we have that fits their use case best? Um, if you like the the contracting and like the fine tuning of, you know, any doc legal documents, you have a contract you're working with. Um, and then it's the the joy of closing a deal, except you're you're not just closing one deal on, you know, buying a business, you're closing a deal on you know, hopefully a couple of times a month on different data deals that you're, you're selling. So, um, and it's just the fun, like similar to podcasting where you just develop, uh, this network of friends and peers you admire. It's the same thing with sales. Like these, all the folks you're talking to often know each other. And so there's, you know, interest being made or like, Hey, this person like knows this other person at a prospect or, or client of ours, they would probably be interested in talking to each other. Um, I even started a podcast for, Altos called House of Data that is about how housing companies use data. And that itself has led to helpful discussions and new sales opportunities for Altos research. And so the um, sales function has been a really fun thing. I have a very storied seven-month career selling data, but uh, so far it has been a lot more fun and uh, engaging than I thought it would be. Were you given a blank canvas for how to set up kind of the sales funnel or was there already some structure in place that you kind of could take with and run? There was loose structure. So we, we use HubSpot. And so we would see leads come in from time to time or folks selling the other half of the, the other product that we sell. They would be talking to somebody who is a better fit for data licensing. And so they would send them over, over to my side. But um there was no prospecting um, for for new licensing clients. Um, there wasn't someone spending their their full time effort just on working with licensing clients. It was either the founder, and then the founder hired a, a technical salesperson who could come in and help support the founder in some of those conversations. But of course, as a founder, you're 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 not just doing one thing. You're doing you know ten things throughout the day to keep the business running. You can't focus much time on, on sales. And so coming in, I could focus all of my time on sales and start developing more of a, um, of a playbook on how we go about um, prospecting, working with customers, handling red lines for contracts, pricing, all these other pieces, and put together a more comprehensive sales strategy. And that has been uh, a ton of fun and more fun than I expected it to be. But um, still a lot to learn. It's still a very new part of the business. And so, uh, sales is something that doesn't end. Like there's not a point where you're done. Like it's always an evolution, an evolving team and process. And hopefully as your business, hopefully your business is growing and needs a different structure to your sales team. You'll bring in a VP of sales eventually, or a CRO as you become more successful. So, um, there's always like the next step to take as a sales team. Um, and so that, Kind of the never-ending game part is is also a lot of fun. All right. We've covered why starting a podcast is important. We've covered chief of staff. We have covered uh, data businesses, which was fascinating. Thank you for the last 30 minutes. Um, I learned a lot. Um, we're going to pivot and bring this home on more of a fun topic because I have not seen this one come across my desk. But you are obsessed with Carbonara and making it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What's happening here? Why why is this the thing? So there's kind of two food theories that I have. Um, one, so I do love carbonara. I think it's fantastic. I don't think many folks, I haven't seen it done. It's often done not very well because it's a, it's a, um, you're taking this raw egg yolk and mixing it into noodles. And so you're you're not trying to scramble the, if it's too hot, you'll scramble the egg and you'll ruin the texture. And so you have to get the temperature just right. And so often when you serve this, this meal, it's not piping hot. So it kind of throws folks off sometimes, um, but it's really delicious and creamy. And I use that as a, uh, this is my first of two theories. So my first theory is find a, if you're gonna evaluate restaurants, find a benchmarking recipe. 
So if you're, if you really like cheeseburgers, I'm sure cheeseburger is your go-to that you can have at multiple restaurants and compare the two. Uh, pepperoni pizza is one, like I'm going to try your pepperoni pizza. If you do that well, it's likely you do everything else well. For Italian restaurants, it's carbonara. If you have a really good carbonara, I'm pretty confident the rest of your menu is also good. But that is my benchmarking. That is the way that I evaluate how, like how the rest of the menu may likely go. Um, <laughs> and my other theory is the, the chicken theory is what I call it, okay. which is if you're at a restaurant and they have chicken and steak or pork and steak or what have you, uh, get the chicken or get the pork because they're going to have to work harder to sell that dish. Like steak, you can salt, you put salt and pepper on it, put it on the grill and sell it and it will sell all day long because everyone loves steak and it's really easy. Nothing you have to do to it. Nothing special needs to happen for you to sell tons and tons of steak in your restaurant. However, for fun, for someone to see steak and chicken on a menu and to choose the chicken, it's because the chicken is really, has to be really like, you know, dressed up. There's going to be more herbs and seasonings. Maybe it's going to be, uh, breaded in some way or have some uh some other like texture element added or more sauce and cream and they're going to do more to the chicken to make it taste good so that it sells on the menu and so if you've never been somewhere before get the slightly lesser meat because they're going to often have to do more to it to make it sell and it will be a more flavorful meal than the steak if we're looking at the chicken data charts a month from now, you're going to see a spike hit uh, this day. And it's because the millions of listeners that listen to this podcast are about to go out and order chicken and you're going to see uh, steak sales plummet. That's a Rest great theory. Soul. That's actually really, really true. It's hard. You have to go out of your way to screw up a steak, but chicken's pretty bland. So you really kind of got to do some work to it to make it make it better. Yeah, especially pork chops, too. <laughs> Most folks don't like pork chops or a lot, a lot of folks don't like pork generally, but, um, and pork chops are, I don't see them very often at restaurants. And so when I see a pork chop, I'm kind of intrigued. Like hmm, there's a, there's a reason they put this on here next to a steak where, you know, you can, often those are, those can be seen as kind of similar dishes. So if I'm going to, if I'm looking at a pork chop, hmm, maybe I, I had one recently at a restaurant and it was delicious and it was fantastic. <laughs> and they added all these different herbs and like uh, they had tomatoes and stuff to it. It was amazing. I had the, this like mango chutney and they had, they worked really hard to make that pork chop really good. And it was delicious. Alex, this has been great. Uh, if people want to get in touch with you, how can they find you? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, my podcast is Think Like an Owner. It's focused on CEOs who run great businesses. Um, you can find it pretty much anywhere you get podcasts. And if you want to reach out to me, I'm at LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, either of those will be pretty easy to get a hold of me. Um, so I'd go there or my website, tlaopodcast.com. There's a contact form if you want to go that way too. Cool. Alex, thanks again. Awesome. Thanks, Chris.